Drug Use and Pandemics as Public Health Issues Hello, this opinion piece attempts to vocalize one of the other angles that has come up for me. The COVID-19 pandemic was declared a full-blown state of emergency in most jurisdictions, like a 9-11 scale event. But do you remember when big public health issues did not require a war footing? Approaching 40 years old, I sure don't. When a law is enacted which threatens prison for any offense, that behavior has been criminalized, declared illicit. The prosecution and externalities of the war on drugs has devastated multiple generations. It has had disproportional impacts in some neighborhoods, minorities, and subcultures. Most think it is clearly ineffective and counterproductive, yet only 11 states hold legal cannabis so far. Freer citizens once had the autonomy to put what they wanted into their own bodies, absent harm to others. This seems like a minimum running requirement for any definition of sovereignty. But for over 100 years, the public health issue of drug misuse has been criminalized. This compounds the direct public health threats with unregulated drug safety, more disease spread in stigmatized undergrounds, financially crippling fines, decades in prisons, arms races within illicit markets, and potentially less neighborly law enforcement. These conditions also compound poverty, decreasing average life expectancy for those who get caught up. These solutions to illicit drugs have caused exponentially more harm than the direct problems of those drugs alone. Meanwhile, Big Pharma gets away with murder legally, and citizens assume licit medicines have been thoroughly tested as safe enough to put in their body. Out of all prisoners under jurisdiction of state correctional authorities at the end of 2016, almost 15% had a drug offense as their most serious offense. 45,000 people were in prison for drug possession alone. Almost 145,000 people were in prison for drug trafficking and other drug offenses, activities which might not exist without a war on drugs. You can also see some reasons behind claims of systemic demographic biases. 47% or 81,900 of sentenced federal prisoners on September 30, 2016 were serving time for a drug offense. So between state and federal levels, the latest data tracks the land of the free with about 272,000 prisoners inside for drug charges. If only 80% don't otherwise pose enough societal risk to imprison, then that is just one snapshot of 217,000 people with destroyed lives which could have been prevented by legalizing drugs. Of the 3.7 million adults on probation in the United States at the end of 2015, 25%, approximately 947,000 people, had a drug charge as their most serious offense. So overall, 1.5% of the adult population is likely on probation right now. Have you ever lived a year of your life worried that a rolling stop sign could bring you into prison? Living with that much legitimate fear also has negative health consequences. Our collective institutions have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force outside of direct self-defense. If they are democratically controlled by we the people, then there is a risk that a majority can create laws to imprison subsets of various minorities at higher rates. But restricting anyone's basic freedoms is never to be taken lightly. Prisons are not healthy for people in any dimension. Imprisoning a person has a high probability of destroying their life. Many lose their basic right to vote because of laws that are not just. What's more, it's the most legal form of human slavery in America under the 13th Amendment. If you don't think we already have some kind of police state, then where is the line for you? Since the war on drugs peaked, the prison industrial complex has diversified into the War of Terror. The corporatocracy has also circled back to capitalize on age-old fears of immigrants, as in the beginning of the war on drugs. Given the observable context throughout my life, why would I trust these institutions to try to save hypothetical lives on a black swan level when we the people can't get it to stop proactively destroying hundreds of thousands of other lives? Few have decent track records in my book. We've already got an urgent, backlogged need to reduce criminalization and state-enforced harm, not increase it. I don't want to dare anyone to see how much closer we can get to 1984 before swinging the pendulum back. And I don't want the smoking gun to come in the form of 
something censored from social media. These societal structures need to be seriously course-corrected and repaired before they attempt any new massive endeavors, which have grave unforeseen consequences. Governments can be wildly dangerous vehicles. Are we the people even driving? So when thinking about our modern world of pandemics, please understand that we should avoid criminalizing anything unless it is absolutely necessary. As I've described in my other videos and essays, there were no risk assessments of COVID-19 realistic enough to have ever resulted in the suspension of basic rights nor threats of prison. I'll leave you with the words of General Barry R. McCaffrey, Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy under President Bill Clinton from 1996 to 2001. This is from a keynote address at the National Conference on Drug Abuse Prevention Research in 1996. Quote, we have a 1997 budget before Congress now, and we need help. We need to get the budget of $15.1 billion and the $250 million supplemental funding request passed by Congress. Most of that money is for law enforcement and prisons, and that is okay. Drugs are wrong, and you have to uphold the law. We must have law enforcement authorities address the issue, because if we do not, prevention, education, and treatment messages will not work very well. But having said that, I also believe that we have created an American gulag. We have 1.6 million people behind bars, and probably two-thirds of those in the federal system are there for drug-related crimes." End quote. 